you? I got shy all of a sudden. Or they can call me by my first name, but on the first day, I, I like to tell them, it's Dr. Rogers. Well, let's get into it. Let's talk about the neuroscience of creativity then. All right. You let's, got let's it. Skip everything else. Let's get into that. I'm hyper creative. No, really? I, I can't stop ever. I can tell you <laughs> how it works. Give me a, a little bit. Analysis of it. All right. Of hyper creativity. And it, uh, for your audience, it does, it does concern Prince as well. Of course. So creativity involves a capacity to kind of go into your own head. There's a neural network called the default network. And if you need to be creative, if you want to be creative, you stop focusing on external stimuli and you go into your own head. You daydream and you mind wander. Now, for some of us, we're lucky if any idea comes because creativity can't be forced. And even the most creative folks get writer's block. But for us, us mere mortals, you think of something. When you think of something new, a brand new thought, it's filtered through a couple of little circuits here in the right hemisphere. The first one acts like a gate. So let's take myself, who I'm not a hyper-creative, I'm, I'm not especially creative at all, so I'm, I'm just your average thinker. But I gotta think of something creative. I gotta design a poster for a show. Okay, and you open up that gate, and as soon as you get your first idea that's halfway decent, you say, great, I'm gonna go with that. And you automatically shut the gate. And you move it on from the art stage, where creativity is, to the craft stage, actually making the thing that you thought of. And you get busy with your craft, and there you go. And then you evaluate your poster or your song or whatever, and, and you're done with it. For a, folk, a person who is uh, hyper-creative, those gates are broken, and they stay open. So in a hyper-creative person, the ideas just keep coming and coming and coming. Now, for most of us, that gate is there to separate relevant from irrelevant information. This is what's going to work for me, this is what isn't, and I'm going to close my mind to anything that I've already decided isn't going to work for this poster or this song. But in a hyper-creative, they're open to all input. And they keep going and going and going and going and going because they have reduced inhibition. Those gates don't close. They have a leaky faucet. Um, Prince, being so facile with his leaky faucets, could think of ideas constantly throughout the day, at any phase of the day, and with his dexterity and his virtuosity on so many different instruments. Once he did transition from art to craft, he could work for hours. There was nothing stopping him. He didn't have to stop and wait for other musicians. He could play drums and keys and bass and guitar and vocals, and then the gate is open and more songs are coming. That's a hyper-creative. It's um, relatively rare. I've only known in the music business, I I've only worked with two of them. One was Prince, and the other is sitting right over there in that corner to my left. <laughs> in a hyper-creative situation, my friend Tommy here, We'd be working on a Gaggy Ta record. I'd be printing a mix, printing a mix. And Tommy would say, wait, because the ideas never stop coming. It's a, it's, it's, it's a rare um, both gift and burden. I'd like to leave your listeners with a final image. I would love that. That's just dancing around in my head right now. Please. So you get a call from someone in the morning, your hotel room in Los Angeles, often the Sunset Marquee that says, you know, he's ready, which means get in that rental car and get down there. You, get, you come here to this room, you set up whatever tape you might have been working on the night before, whatever you asked for, maybe even fresh tape, and make sure things are mic'd and routed. And you're there, and your ears open because you're listening for the distinctive click of his high-heeled boots. <laughs> Coming down, you can he you hear the gate clang, and you're wondering, is this him? And then you're hearing those footsteps on the cement, and you're hearing that, those footsteps on that floor. And this man walks in, and he's impeccably dressed. He always dressed well, but even better in Los Angeles than at home. He's impeccably dressed. He's got this scent, this perfume that was custom for him. He's got his makeup and he's got those hands, those musicians' hands. He comes in and doesn't say much, but this beautiful man comes in the room. His aura fills the whole place. He issues you a, a few simple directives. And in that moment, you know, off we go for another day 
for another song. He never came in and sat behind that console and wondered, what should I do today? Never. He came in with a full tank of gas every time with a plan and with music in his head, part of the reasons why he was so darn quiet. There was so much of that going on. And you just basically facilitate this incredible process, the process of his head of creation. Sunset enabled that creativity. The, the, the technicians that you have working here, the equipment that does not fail. <laughs> Once you started, it just flowed. And I, I, our gratitude to this studio and everyone involved for enabling his work. That's incredible. I literally want to put B-roll up while you talk and make a <laughs> one-minute clip out of that and watch it every single day. Mm -hmm.